Okay, great. Does anybody have any opening questions or comments that they'd like to say in response to that? Thanks very much, and, and uh, that was an excellent talk, I thought. And um, I agree with you, I, with you thinking that we need to look at ways to build more solidarity among, among European citizens, uh, so that there is that shared vision that we can actually have a debate about how we want to live together as Europeans. Um, I'm just, just wondering about the way you laid out um, we were going to get there. You say, if I get you right, you were saying we were going to focus, we should, or the European Union should focus more on the big projects, the grand visions. And uh, I'm just wondering, do you think that's sufficiently close to the citizens? Do you think the ordinary citizen will notice a tangible difference in their lives or will notice the impact of Europe on their lives? We had the, the Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs here at the Institute uh, a few weeks ago and she was saying, uh, she was talking about the, the roaming, uh, uh, the roam like at home that came in and, and saying we need to focus both on the grand projects and also on the small projects closer to the citizens. So how, how, how do you think Europe can make itself be you know, felt closer to the citizens? I think that's a really good question. I suppose, I mean, when I, when I talk about um, a federal model in terms of governance, really I'm talking about decision making. So, I mean, when you, when you have um, decision making exclusively at a European level, in the European Parliament, the Commission, it is so remote, people don't really understand it. Um, um, and I think it's, Ireland is a really terrible example of this because we have we don't really have local government. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a kind of a fallacy. Um, we have things called local councils, but they have basically no power. Um, I was a member of Dublin City Council for several years, so I suppose what I'm talking about is is decision making at a local level affecting local people. Um, you know, in healthcare and education and so on. That's not to say you can't have big projects on those same topics. Um, you know, things like um, mobility of insurance across the European Union um, is a really big project and it really matters to citizens' lives. Like Erasmus is a great one. Um, I think that we have to have much greater decision making around education at local level. I think there needs to be more autonomy. Um, but at the same time, you can have really positive initiatives like the Erasmus programme as one example. And indeed, you know, Horizon 2020 and cooperation in terms of research um, through universities across across the union. So one isn't mutually mutually exclusive to the other, but but you know you have to pick your projects um, at, at European level, and there has to be a purpose to doing it on a on a cross European or pan European basis. Um, and I think that's that's the challenge that we face in, in that regard. Um, and I think that that can be really tangible to people at a local level. Uh, it can have a really big impact on people's lives, um, and uh, and you know I think if you look at the the Brexit vote in the UK, you see that young people uh, overwhelming, overwhelmingly voted to remain in the European Union, um, and that's because one of the big the, one of the most most important big ideas or big causes of of the European project, which is free movement of people, because that that mobility for young people is so important. Um, not so important, it would appear, um, to the older generation. Although an awful lot of them have houses down around Marbella, so I don't know. Um, <laughs> seem a bit confused about that. Um, but uh, you know, so so th they're the kind of big big ideas, I guess, that um, that I think really do matter um, and are absolutely you know part of the European agenda. Um, I think it's. You know, it's simple things like running a, running a small business. I mean, some of... And this has really been... I would definitely give credit to the Juncker Commission in this respect. I mean, the Juncker Commission has actually done a very good job in dealing with a lot of the bureaucracy and red tape that people complain about, which they, they perceive to be interfering in their lives in a negative way as opposed to in a constructive way. Um, and so there's been a real effort to, you know, make it easier to do business, to be more mobile, um, to cut down the bureaucracy and the requirements for, for micro <coughs> micro businesses and small businesses and that's been very successful. So that's sort of you know, get you know, stop interfering in that sort of stuff um, at an EU level. You have to have a certain amount of regulation to make it easy for people to do business cross borders and to be able to compete and to prevent the sort of protectionism that instinctively a lot of member states would like to impose. Um, but you have to do that in a user friendly way and not a way that just you know grates on 
um, people who are actually trying to get on with their lives. So it, it's a balance, definitely. Um, and I, I actually think that the EU has really improved in that front. Um, you don't hear about it much in the media, of course, but um, but there there have been major efforts in the last three years in particular to do that. I mean, isn't, isn't, that, a, sorry, 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 isn't that a problem that, that you don't hear that the European Union doing any of this? That, and not to generalise, but that member state governments like to claim the credit for anything Obviously. good that comes from Brussels and like to point the finger every time, you know, something that unpopular comes through. Yeah, yeah, always. And... You know, we're guilty of that in this country. We're probably not as bad as in some other member states um, in that regard. Um, I'm thinking of some of what's happening in some of the East European member states at the moment, which is quite concerning, um, where Brussels is blamed for everything, pretty much. Um, I'm thinking of the UK, of course, where that's been the mantra for you know, 40, 40, 44 years. Um, there's been a lot of it in Ireland, but we're not as bad at it. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think particularly, you know, we have a, I think we have a very internationalist, outward looking team at the top of government at the moment. Um, and I, I think that that will count in terms of the narrative and the rhetoric around Europe and Ireland. Uh, I certainly hope so. Now, yesterday's Apple decision <laughs> did not necessarily help that <coughs> rhetoric or tone um, and the response from the Department of Finance probably was a bit intemperate, but... Um, but uh, but but besides that particular um, chestnut, I think um, I think that you know the, the the tone and engagement has been positive, and um, certainly that's been the case coming from the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Taoiseach, I think, in the last couple of months. Well, where, where can changes come from in regarding that it, that problem that Max identified? Because you know, as it is, the incentives for politicians to be more pro-European aren't necessarily there, and um, there's a lot of calls for solidarity and. And you know um, this kind of issue that you know a pro-European outlook. But why would you do that if you're a politician? Where's the political will coming from when when it's easy to go to Brussels and say, yeah, we're all in, and then just go home and say, oh, I was just at this meeting, and they, you know, they're they're not thinking yeah. about you at all. Um, does there need to be fundamental changes in the European Union or within the structures that we have and the treaties that we have? Is there a way of fixing this problem of? of Solidarity and dissonance. I think it's very difficult. Um, you'll find it in large member states between the the centre, the capital, and the regions. You know, um, <coughs> have you ever met anyone from Cork? <laughs> I'm, I'm married to one. I'm only joking. Um, but uh, like you know, it's always going to be a problem. There's always going to be that suspicion and that kind of blame game. Um, you know, you you find it internally in member states, and obviously you have it vis-a-vis um, -vis Brussels. But a large part of it is just a complete and utter lack of engagement. I mean, most of our TDs frankly, you know, know nothing about how the European project works. Um, you know, uh, there's just no, there's no incentive. And because we're uh, physically, we're an island, it's even more acute, you know. So, I, I mean, I recall when I was in, in uh, elected politics and indeed in youth politics, um, you know, the amount of exchanges that went on between parliaments, um, between MPs through the, their political groups, so through the EPP and ALDE and so on. I mean, it was constant. So German German MPs would be visiting Dutch MPs and French MPs, and it was a constant exchange. And we are quite excluded from that, um, not by design, but we're you know we're just we're marginal. So it actually requires us to make an extra effort. Um, it requires the Oireachtas as an entity to put a put resources into it and to. And to and to make it a priority, and it also requires, you know, TDs and senators to educate themselves and see it as a responsibility. And I don't think you can force people to assume their responsibility. Sometimes you just have to, you know, encourage them, and uh, and they and they need to do it um, themselves. I also think that the media has a, a role to play. The media. Uh, also needs to be educated and has a responsibility to educate itself. I mean, if you look at Brussels at the moment, as one example, you have uh, one correspondent from the Irish Times and you have one correspondent from RTE. Um, the Independent doesn't have anybody in Brussels. Um, you know, News Talk doesn't have anybody in Brussels. Um, and, and so we're actually really poorly served uh, in terms of you know, our own media, you know, occasionally there's a, a junket, and they kind of are junkets, you know, where a bunch of journalists go out and they, they 
go to a couple of briefings in the commission and the parliament and then they go for a lot of drinks and then they come home and you know I think that that, that you know newspaper editors also have a responsibility um, and and radio editors and so on to, to, to actually make it a priority to educate their staff and themselves when they're going to be covering this stuff and you know it is so fundamental to everything that goes on in Ireland you know whatever I mean nobody can really say what the percentage of legislation is that's that emanates from from European institutions it's somewhere in the region of about 70 to 80 percent but it's a hell of a lot of legislation uh, and policy um, that is directly decided it's influenced by us but it's decided in Brussels and uh, um, you know to just sort of ignore that blithely and pretend that everything happens and we're at this when it really doesn't um, you know we need to we need to raise our game in terms of understanding the process and educating ourselves. Yeah. I have actually a question. I, I moved actually to uh, Ireland from uh, Dublin to Ireland in 2013. Um, and I think I moved to Ireland from Germany. I married an Irish man, so I moved here. And it's interesting, so that it's a very personal experience. And if you look at the economy of Ireland, it's all very much concentrated on the states all the multinationals, IT companies that are here and having a lot of um, Europeans working for them. And then you have a very strong connection to the UK, but if you look into the other countries like, for example, Germany where I am from, or France, or all the other European unions, on an economic point of view, um, I think there could be more leverages, but that's like something in my personal view, and I would be interested, is that historical, is that, so why, what, what, do, what, is, what are the reasons for that? Uh, partly, partly cultural, partly historical, and partly just because the single market still doesn't work as well as it should. So, um, I mean, cultural is, we speak English, um, we're, we're not great, unfortunately, at learning other foreign languages, European languages, um, so it's kind of a laziness, um, or at least a failing in our education system. So it's, it's, it's easy for us to, to do business with the UK and others. Um, and it's historical, of course, because um, you know, we were under British rule, and, uh, and so our links with the UK um, are hundreds and hundreds of years old. Since we joined the European Union, or the community as it was, in 73, our dependence on the UK as a market has dramatically reduced. So, um, you know, exported goods is less than about 40% now to the UK, it's less than 40% to the UK. Um, uh, likewise, it services. Um, and, uh, and our dependency on the rest of the European Union as a market has greatly increased. So, and that's, that's, that, that sort of process is continuing all the time. So we have much stronger trade links now with France and Germany and other countries than we did. Um, but it's still a challenge. And when I was Minister for European Affairs, of course, a big part of what all ministers did and do um, is, you know, is promoting trade with other, with other member states. And obviously, because I was across the European Union a lot of the time, I did a lot of work with Enterprise Ireland and IDA um, in France and Germany and Belgium and uh, Hungary and other places. Um, and, you know, some of those markets are very, still very protectionist. It's very, very, very difficult to get a product or service into the French market, for example. Um, that's probably the most protectionist um, of all the, the, the member states. Um, and, you know, Ireland has obviously been a huge advocate of deepening the single market and, you know, getting on with the, the agenda of um, a single market for services uh, in the European Union, which we don't fully have, um, and the digital single market. Uh, and that meets a lot of resistance um, from, from some of the member states. Um, uh, so it, it, it's a tricky one. Uh, it's improving, but, but it's, it's slow. Um, and, uh, and obviously then, you know, the, the language barrier can, can be, it's not always, but it can be uh, a challenge. Um, but it's, it, it is improving. And, you know, Enterprise Ireland do a good job in that. They're very, they're very, they have very little resources. Um, I know we're expecting stuff in the budget, um, but IDA and EI need a lot more funding to help. Because small companies, I mean, really, you're talking about indigenous business. I mean, the MNCs are great. Um, you know, they, they employ couple of hundred thousand people directly, more indirectly obviously, 
in the Irish economy and they're really important and we're not going to give that up lightly for sure but I mean everybody wants to develop the indigenous economy everybody wants to see more indigenous Irish um, exports in goods and services um, but that that needs support um, to open those markets um, and to help particularly small medium-sized companies that just don't have you know the market knowledge they don't have the access they don't have the capacity um, they need assistance to, to do it and other countries are better at that than we are um, other countries are also just better developing intellectual property um, um, and also at developing investment capacity indigenously. Um, and I think there's a lot we can learn from other countries. Some of the Nordic countries, Israel is a brilliant one um, as, as an example, that really could help. But I'm sorry, we're veering a bit off topic, but, um, but it's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so here on in the news, the commission chose to remind them before the Court of Justice uh, regarding the, the Apple case. And it came out as well in Danish news and on Danish, so because the Commission of Competition is Danish. Um, yeah. So how does, uh, like how do you see this case about uh, Ireland like, t- taxing uh, Apple with such a low proper tax rate? Uh, is it fair? Uh, to promote like foreign uh, investment, <coughs> or is it like uh, distorting tax competition? I think it, there's very little that's fair about how we tax corporate entities globally. Um, it's not unique to Ireland; it's it's a global problem, and I think the solution should be global. Um, so no, it's not fair. <laughs> um, Having said that, um, do I think it's the business of the European Commission? Do I think really it's a competition issue? No, I don't. Um, um, and I, I would have strong views about that. Um, but you know, the case is what it is, and we're going to have to. We're going to have you know the, the, both the government and Apple are appealing it, and it'll go to the ECJ. I actually think that we'll probably lose the case. Um, so the, the, <laughs> that'll be that'll have profound implications in probably four or five years' time. Um, But do I think that the action of the Commission yesterday was right or proportionate? I thought it was outrageous, frankly. I thought it was a stunt. Um, Everybody who is involved in this case, who is aware of the facts, knows that the Irish government, aka our officials in the Department of Finance, have been dealing on a daily basis with Commissioner Vestager's uh, cabinet and her team in DG Comp. They are well aware of the constitutional challenges, the public procurement challenges, which are... EU uh, rules that the Irish government is trying to abide by in setting up this fund Um, and the way it was handled was a publicity stunt. I think it was appalling Uh, and that's just my my view Um, and I think that anybody who has been involved in it and understands how it has been worked, how how it has worked over the last number of months um, since the fine was imposed um, couldn't but agree with that. Um, You know, there is no objective reason for the commissioner to take that action yesterday, other than publicity. And I think it's really unfortunate. It damages the reputation of the commission here. Um, it damages Ireland's reputation unfairly and unnecessarily across the rest of the European Union. And it's, 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 it's just not right because, you know, while the Irish government is appealing it, and we can have a difference of opinion with the commission, the Irish government, and particularly our finance officials, have been you know, deeply engaged in this process hand in hand with the European Commission to try and resolve it and uh, it, it was really it was it was shabby the way they approached it um, and the lack of notice and everything it was I mean it can only it can only be described as a stunt. I just I'm just curious about the tax standardization to your views in terms of the conversation going on in Europe uh, because obviously Ireland is a part of the perceived as a part of the problem by the other states so I'd like to hear what what's, is debated and what's your opinion about that. I mean, I mean, it's a debate that's been going on for well over a decade. Um, I mean, I I not really I don't really understand why members other member states and indeed commission officials continually talk about tax rates and um, taxing uh, companies when. Um, 
when clearly they you know it's not an EU competence it's and this is kind of back to the point about subsidiarity I mean tax competition firstly is is fundamentally important to the economic survival of peripheral member states like ours um, if we want to create a European Union and particularly a monetary union which is just about transfers um, from the wealthy core member states to the peripherals like us well fine um, Let's have that debate in Germany, for example. I don't think it will go down too well in BUILD or, um, <laughs> or indeed with the AFD and others. Um, you know, I think, I think we have to understand that, um, that we have to, you know, there's, very, there's no scope to, uh, there's no room for manoeuvre with interest rates once you're in, 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 a, in a, a currency union as we are. Um, so there has, to be, there has to be flexibility in other ways and tax competition is fundamental. And it's... And it's it's clearly prescribed in the treaties. I just don't know why we continually have this debate over and over because until uh, there is uh, a new treaty which decides that we have all uh, given up our right to set and decide on our own tax rates and our own tax systems, um, then it's a completely moot argument. It's, it's, I mean, it's, a lot of it is showboating. I mean, I recall in 2011 when we came into government, we were in the middle of a, an IMF bailout, and it was the one thing that I think really left a bad taste in my mouth was how we were treated by the French government at the time, um, Monsieur Sarkozy, who was in our sister party in France. Um, uh, firstly, and Kenny went to his very first European summit. It was the day after the government was formed, and there was an attempt to kind of publicly humiliate him and demand that Ireland, you know, if we want to be supported by our European partners in a time of absolute crisis in this country, let's face it, uh, that we had to somehow give up our right to set our own tax rate. I mean, that was the, that was the demand. Um, and uh, I recall my first visit to Paris after uh, maybe about a month later as Minister for European Affairs. And, you know, we had a very nice time and it was all lovely. And then we went to a meeting and the Euro my counterpart, the European Affairs Minister, launched into this attack about Ireland's tax rates. I mean, and I told him it was none of his business, which it wasn't. Um, and, 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 you know, this is going to flare up again and again and again. And at the end of the day, it's completely moot point because um, unless there is a change to um, the European treaties, you know, it's not going to happen. And, and, and how many other countries want to uh, give up their right to set their own tax rates? This uh, tax standardization will not happen because no, but, it's but, a common budget. But, but I mean, you have federal models all over Europe and all over the world where mm. there are where there are local taxes um, and there are local tax rates and they're not set at <coughs> federal level. So you can have you can have. I mean, I mean, VAT is effectively a European tax. Uh, I mean, it effectively funds the EU budget, um, and uh, and there's an argument that there that there should be other ways to raise revenues. Uh, to contribute to a, a European budget, the EU budget, or to a uh, Eurozone fund. <coughs> That's a debate I think we definitely can have. But the idea that we would have tax rates set centrally for the whole of the European Union, I think, would be completely bananas. And, and tax um, basis in the same way, or is that a separate issue when it comes to corporate tax bases? It's pretty well, it, 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 well. Look, it's, it's the same issue. It's coming at it from a different angle, effectively. But the, yeah. the objective is exactly But I'm just thinking digital. Yeah. Like, a lot of the yeah. what came out of the digital summit was that now with the way you can kind of manipulate sales digitally, you could basically have it that all your sales are in one country, and, and that doesn't seem <coughs> fair. Um, from an economic point of view, so no, and I think that I think there is there is some I mean, there is some merit in that debate, but again, I think that they are issues that I mean, what happens if you if you address that that specific tax concern, tax evasion or tax avoidance concern, shall we say, um, simply in the European Union, just go to Singapore, yes. whatever, yes. go back to Donald Trump's low corporate tax utopia that, that's uh, in the pipeline. You know, I mean, why, you know, it's, it's like FTT, the financial transactions tax. It's great. Oxfam, everybody's campaigning for it. It sounds so lovely and fuzzy and wonderful. Great. And obviously countries like Ireland and the UK said, well, we don't want to be part of it because we have a very large financial services industry here and we don't want to disadvantage it versus vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, New York and elsewhere. And as it evolved, a number of member states under provisions in the Lisbon Treaty decided, okay, we're going to go and do it through enhanced cooperation. Great. And off they go. And then they find, well, actually, 
a few of them start having second thoughts. Mm, not so sure about this. We actually have quite a few financial services and funds and so on in in our country, and I'm not sure this is going to work if Ireland and the UK and others aren't doing it. So suddenly they start backing out, and eventually the whole thing is abandoned. And that's that's what's going to happen. I mean, you know, the French can continue going on about CCCTB or corporate tax harmonisation, etc. But you know, the idea that it would actually happen is just complete fantasy. I mean, the idea that Estonia or Latvia or Cyprus or Malta or Ireland or Poland or a whole range, even the, ne- the Netherlands, even Luxembourg. I mean, you know, if you look to the funds industry in Luxembourg, I mean, no chance. Um, whatever Jean Claude Juncker said, he's you know, he's he's part of, he was part of the architect of of. Um, of the system and the incentives that are in place in Luxembourg um, that have developed the, the funds industry there. So, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of this stuff, again, you know, it's it's showboating. And I mean, you know, while we, we talk on the one hand and we complain about politicians blaming Europe for stuff, um, and we've certainly seen a lot of that, there's also the risk that others start to kind of try and make examples of or, you know, create this narrative about others um, and it, you know it's 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 in order to generate positive publicity and, and and try and score political points and that's just as negative and corrosive as blaming Brussels you know so I think you know back to the point about solidarity which you mentioned I mean, solidarity has to be at un- about understanding that we all need a model that will work um, for all of us um, and it has to be one that allows for different systems, different economic models, um, because a homogenous one just absolutely won't work. It, it, it simply won't work, and, uh, and, and anyway, nobody's going to agree to it. So let's move on, move on to a debate where we can actually change things, um, because tax harmonisation is just not going to happen. Yep. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to ask, you, you mentioned about basically the attitude of Ireland, like one of most people, EU countries in terms of the population and, and its feelings for the European Union. And then that seems to kind of contrast against um, the example you gave of the TDs not having any kind of clue and some, uh, some of them anyway about how the uh, European Union works or perhaps the fact that Irish people did not know to the Nice and Lisbon referendum the first time round. And there is like, that feeling of disconnect as well from, from the institutions in Europe. Why is it that when these surveys are carried out that there is a problem you sent them? Does it simply down to this idea that um, CAP is good or like the agricultural industry would be flattened if it didn't have the European Union? Is it as kind of as basic as that's just a money kind of thing? I think I mean I think it's I think it's largely about a sense of um, prosperity that we have experienced since we joined and obviously that was uh, challenged um, during the financial crisis but overall I mean Irish people are remarkably better off than when we joined and I think it's also the nature of our economy it's an export economy and um, we know that US US firms are not just in Ireland to service the Irish market, clearly. Um, we know that they're here because they want um, access to the rest of the European Union, likewise with their financial services and so on. Um, we know that our membership of the Eurozone gives us a, 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 an advantage, um, it gives us a lot of challenges as well, but it's an advantage in that we are the only English-speaking member of the Eurozone. Um, we are perceived to be a gateway to the European Union, all of that. So I think people have just a sense that um, you know, prosperity is linked somehow to our European membership. And also that our dependency on the UK historically um, you know, began to come to an end once we joined the European Union. Um, I think that's, I mean, look, I don't have a monopoly in wisdom on this. That's just my sense. Um, but I don't. I don't really have have all the answers. Um, I I think um, you know. On the one hand, we're very peripheral. We're very cut off from Europe. On on the other hand, and you know, physically cut off. But on the other hand, Irish people like to kind of travel and look outwards. And and I think you know that benefit for 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 young people, mobility, all of that. I think um, is something that we like. Um, so I think there's some of the factors. But I mean, definitely, I think one thing that's quite quite hard to explain is how sentiment has remained consistently so strong notwithstanding 
how things unfolded during the financial crisis and most particularly our treatment by the ECB, which people obviously are very acutely aware of here. Um, the behaviour of, um, of Trichet and, um, and the way in which Ireland was, was, um, was uh, mistreated, I would say, um, during that period. Not, not, not so much by our European colleagues in the Council and in the institutions, but certainly by the ECB. Um, but, 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 but for some reason, you know, we seem to have gotten over that which I think is a good thing, um, because it might not have been the case, you know. Um, and also, obviously, sorry, the other point is the political consensus amongst the main political parties. So Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Labour, all of them have campaigned for, um, and, um, you know, there is just this acceptance that EU membership is a good thing. They might know a whole lot about it necessarily, they might not engage proactively in it, but, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an accepted fact. And also our sort of our trade bodies and our NGOs and so on are very mobilised. Um, and actually, you could say that organisations like IBEC and the IFA are, you know, are very, very engaged and do a lot of work in, in Brussels and with their counterparts in other European countries. Um, and I think that has, has an impact because obviously they're communica- communicating constantly with their members. And probably the, fi- sorry, the final point, and I know I'm kind of going on a bit, um, I mean, I was really, really struck. So I did. I, I was involved a bit in the um, uh, the Irish for Europe campaign in the UK for the Brexit referendum last year, and uh, uh, I went to uh, CBI, the IBEC equivalent in in London. I went to their big annual dinner, um, and I, I I just was completely aghast by the fact that they didn't campaign. Um, you know. What, 80, 85% of their members obviously were in favour of remaining in the EU and they did nothing about it and they had this huge dinner a month before the referendum and they had two speakers pro and anti I mean it, it was just unbelievable they had Michael Harris and Alistair Darling and actually Michael Harris was way better you know he nearly convinced and he wasn't quite convincing but, um, <laughs> but he, he was very he was very good I mean he really he really gave a great speech and I was, it was like a Parallel, can you imagine going to an IBEC event before the Fiscal Compact Treaty referendum or the Lisbon referendum or whatever, and then bringing in a speaker for the no side? You know, it was like, it was extraordinary. So, I mean, we're very lucky, I think, that, you know, that civil society and trade bodies and everybody mobilise in Ireland. And I think the fact that we have had all these referendums, you know, we might not engage um, on a continual basis uh, with the European debate. But thankfully, um, you know, and when you're in politics, you kind of curse having to run these referendum campaigns. Well, we only had to run one, and I'm pleased to say we won at 60-40. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like they are, they are a chore, but, you know, you, you have to engage with people, and it does educate people. And I think it, it is a contributing factor to the fact that Irish people are pro-European, is holding all those referendums, even though we lost a few. Although I wonder if the, if the reason the pro-European views survived the crisis was actually a lack of information and understanding of the system? Do you think it could have been people who thought the Troika was a separate thing to the EU? or the No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, there was constant, constant... I mean, there was a constant barrage of negativity about the European Union. And actually, I mean, there was a pretty successful campaign to conflate the ECB with, you know, the European institutions. Um, And I, I... I don't think it really worked, actually. I think people saw the difference. And, um, you know, I, I mean, the, the, big, the big engagement for me during that period was obviously was the referendum in 2012 on the Fiscal Compact Treaty. And um, people were really clear. I mean, they were angry. They were angry. I mean, they, you know, there was an attempt also to just blame, as usual, to just blame Brussels and kind of absolve the administration or the, the number, the, the series of administrations that had domestically that had led us to, to that point. Um, and some of that was was reasonably successful, but ultimately people people knew um, that there had been huge mismanagement domestically, and they understood that. But they also understood that you know we needed we needed solidarity from our from our European neighbours, and uh, and we got it. I mean, you know the ESM. I mean everybody. I, I mean, we won't have a debate about Angela Merkel, but I mean, I'm a very big fan of hers. I think she is a remarkable politician. And I mean, she was faced with, you know, the equivalent of the Daily Mail, the Telegraph, uh, you know, you name it, on a daily basis saying lazy Irish, la- lazy Greeks, drinking ooze on, you know, bleeding us hard working Germans dry. I mean, that was the narrative in Germany 
every day of the week and she stood up to it um, and you know she got a lot of flack here but she really stood up to it and she proved herself to be a great European leader in my opinion and, and actually a very important friend of, of, of Ireland and, and of the, the whole European project as a result um, and uh, you know whether I don't know I think I think quite a lot of Irish people actually recognize that they certainly do now um, and uh, you know so there there was a some sophistication I think in the understanding of of how much of a challenge it was to 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 to, to build an understanding in other member states about what was going on here. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, how sincere do you think the European Union negotiators are in terms of placing Northern Ireland and the, the border issue relatively near the top of the nego negotiations? And if we don't get a workable solution out of the negotiations, could we be facing into more of the kind of discontent towards Brussels and towards the European Union that, that we've maybe seen in, in, in other countries recently? Yeah, it's a risk. I, I mean, I think, I think that they're very sincere. Um, and actually, it's, it's not just the negotiating team in the Commission, but across all the member states, it's the, it's the issue that they get and understand and are concerned about. People are concerned about the peace process, they're concerned about the border issue. Um, not so much about the east-west trade relationship because they all they all have their own exposures you know whether it's german cars whatever um but i i think i think it's I think it's very sincere um i think the problem is that they don't really understand it i don't i, I don't think that they have a solution i don't think there is a workable solution and i don't think that they understand the unionist mindset in northern ireland so mm -hmm. the question i'm constantly asked in brussels um from colleagues is so is this going to lead to a united Ireland? Like they, they really think that what's going to happen is that everybody will have this sort of dawning um, in, in, uh, in the six counties of Northern Ireland that they will say, we can't have a border, so we'll just vote to join the rest of Ireland. And it'll be as simple as that. Um, and clearly it's not, it's not, it's not going to be that simple. It's not going to happen at all. Um, so... Uh, yeah, there's a naivety, I think, in, in how they're approaching it, but I think it's absolutely sincere. Um, uh, but it's very hard to square a circle, and if the UK leaves the Customs Union, which I believe they will, um, then there, there's no alternative but to have um, customs checks on the border. Yeah, um, It may not be that visible, um, but there will be a border, and we can pretend it's an invisible border. We can call it whatever we want, but I think there will be a border. And it's um, it's going to be very tricky. Yeah, it's back. I'm sorry to bring things back to tax, but um, I just want to ask: when, when you were discussing it with your French counterparts, and you were saying on the Irish tax system, did did you ever mention Luxembourg and Germany's use, or excuse me, France and Germany's companies' use of Luxembourg? Um, and do you have any ideas for why it is that the, the tax chat is always about Ireland when I would say we're greatly eclipsed by what Luxembourg does in terms of tax avoidance. Yeah. Um, I think you've probably answered the question <laughs> in your first remark. Um, I mean, yes, yes is the answer, yeah. I mean, we, we, we very robustly um, defended the Irish model, obviously, and also launched a few scuds. Um, but you have to remember that there was, a, there was a real lack of confidence in the Irish administration at that time. I mean, it was a bizarre. It was a bizarre time to be there because the strategy um, and uh, I, you know, I didn't frame the strategy, and I, I disagreed with it to some extent. The strategy was to go to Paris and Berlin and look for concessions on the Irish debt situation. So that was that was the approach um, because obviously it became very intergovernmental. And the Commission became quite peripheral to to most of these discussions. It was all done at the European Council. So um, Paris and Berlin were really important. So there was a there was a very deliberate, um, uh, I would say, decision um, in Dublin not to antagonise, um, and so um, a lot of that was skirted around. And um, and the reason the reason there's very little focus on Luxembourg is precisely for the reason that you have suggested. I think because um, because there's um, a, a huge exposure, a huge. Um, um, interest in in France and other countries, uh, and uh, and so there hasn't been a whole lot of focus on it. And, uh, and I would say I would imagine that the Irish government would still be very reluctant to start um, sort of throwing mud 
Um, I think there's probably a bit of a sense of, well, you start shining a spotlight too much in Luxembourg and it just comes back and, <laughs> uh, and, and you actually attract it to, 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 to focus on you again. So let's just keep quiet about it. I assume that that's, that's kind of part of the... I mean, that may not continue, though, because I think it's going to get very, very tetchy and heated now between Ireland and the Commission. It already is. Um, very, I mean, relations were at a really, really low level. Um, when the uh, Apple uh, decision, when Vesker's decision was, was first announced, <coughs> very, very, very poor relations. They've kind of been rebuilt because there's been a, you know, there's been a, a diplomatic offensive around Brexit. So it's kind of the Apple thing was put to one side. But now that it's back on the table again, um, I, like, I really worry about it. I, don't, I, I think this will impact on, on all sorts of all sorts of things from Ireland's point of view in terms of Brexit negotiations in terms of goodwill, I, I just think there's a real risk around it because um, we are being portrayed as um, petulant and difficult and so on. And I, as I said earlier, I think it's really unfair, but there is reputational damage, definitely. Yeah, and um, you mentioned the CBI earlier, the fact that you were surprised and how they didn't campaign harder or maybe uh -huh. yeah. Um, it seems like one of the reasons why that might be is just because the city and, and, Lo and London is kind of a little bit different from our model in the sense that international networks uh, are a bit stronger, whereas ours are more European based. Um, the other thing then being that with the friend in the UK leaving, um, and you kind of lost a friend in terms of lobbying for minimizing regulatory burden and so on, to what extent can the fact that they're leaving, will that give them kind of the chance to be able to do my territory working further and so sort of set them up nicely as compared to us while the fact that they're gone means that regulatory burden in Africa and Ireland will get stronger because the EU level will come in. So essentially to what extent will that hurt uh, mm -hmm. the Irish economy? Do you yeah, I mean, I I, I, I I get your point about, um, about the city and about um, their sort of maybe not being quite so concerned about about Europe and Brussels as much as we are, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I spent a lot of time in London, and um, I think um, I, I think that the city has really missed a trick um, by being so reticent on Brexit. I mean, I think that they rode in far too quickly behind the government position, accepting leaving the single market, leave all the rest of it, and I I think they're really going to live to regret that. Um, um, I mean, international financial services in, in London. Um, and the UK is going to pay the price. Um, you know, there will be tens and tens and tens of thousands of jobs leaving city city of London. I mean, it's still going to be a financial hub. It's already happening, though. I mean, I'm working for some of them. They're, they're getting out of town, like they are. Um, and they'll still have a presence in London, but they're definitely um, going to change their structures quite fundamentally. Um, and then the issue of regulatory, regulatory divergence, I think it remains to be seen. Um, you know, there's a massive amount of business done from London um, throughout the rest of the EU. Um, and, you know, they're going to want passporting rights. They're going to want to be able to delegate. They're going to want to try and have as little disruption as possible. But it's going to be very difficult, um, particularly if they go off on a kind of, a, you know, I know the threat has been that they're going to do a sort of a Hong Kong or Singapore or whatever. I I tend to think that that's going to be very difficult, um, and I think if they start to do that, they'll they'll lose even more business to 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 Frankfurt, to Dublin, to Luxembourg, um, to to Brussels, which is a one that nobody was really expecting on the insurance front. Um, uh, so I think on balance, um, I mean, unless there is a you know a complete change in direction in the UK government, which is not impossible. Um, I, I, I think that they're going to really try to minimise uh, regulatory divergence. I think they're going to try and have equivalence um, in most respects and they're going to plead for mercy. I mean, this is a one-sided negotiation. Um, you know, all the cards are on the EU side. And um, that hasn't dawned on Boris Johnson yet. But you know, if you talk to officials in Treasury, if you talk to officials in the Foreign Office, um, they get it and they're really worried and um, they're right to be because they're completely unprepared for all of this um, and it's very sad and it's going to be disastrous um, but uh, but I, I, I think it's going to have uh, you know profound implications to the UK economy and 
I think that ultimately they're going to try and keep their their, their regulatory um, parameters very very much in in line with the EU. and that's not just in FS that's across across the board because otherwise more and more firms are just going to leave. You have a one more question or comment, anybody? Yeah, Hannah. I have a question in and around, um, just around uh, an aspect of younger State of the Union speech. Um, when he talked about the proposal or his idea that eventually the Commission Council and Commission President and the Council President could be merged, mm -hmm. which is you know an interesting theoretical idea, but building on your background in European youth politics and the different decisions and iterations of debates around getting to the lead candidate process for the European Parliament elections, which has only really happened once successfully. Where do you think that might go in the next 20 years? I mean, I, I think the European project is going to go in one direction, and I think it will be closer cooperation. And I think that the institutions... I don't think that there should be a mad drive to sort of put the institutional reform first because we've tried that and it didn't work and it kind of um, it doesn't excite people. It kind of it can be manipulated in a sort of a, a negative way by opponents of the the European project full stop. Um, and I just think, given everything that we've been through in recent times, what's the point in opening up those debates again? until you have um, sort of tangible cooperation and, um, and progress. There's a lot of things that, that just haven't happened, that, that we can do under the Lisbon Treaty, you know, in, in security and defence, which I mentioned earlier, but in other areas as well, um, digital single market, all this stuff is doable um, within the existing framework. So um, I'm not afraid of treaty change, but I just think there's no, there's no point in trying to put the cart before the horse. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I'm, a, I'm absolutely convinced that that, that that type of arrangement has to be the case. I want to see directly elected president of the commission um, and that person chairing the council I think would be fantastic. Um, you know, the day that, um, that the member states would agree to that um, I think is probably more than 20 years off, but, um, but hopefully it'll happen in my lifetime. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think we have to move towards that and we have to, we have to toss around these ideas and um, you know they're they're important. I'd like to see you know panels of MEPs lectured across the EU as well. All this stuff was in the Convention of Future Europe, and they're all still as valid today as uh, uh, those ideas are still as valid today as they were then. Um, but 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 I think obsessing with institutional change is probably a waste of time, frankly. And uh, I think getting on with the substance first that we have the capacity to do, and then and then and then reopen those debates maybe a little bit down the road, or have them, but you know really seriously reopen them um, a little bit down the road.